So many people are watching the crypto and Web 3.0 space looking for the next hot trends that can kick off another wave of adoption. In the past, we've seen lots of excitement around alternative layer one blockchains and scaling solutions that make blockchains faster and cheaper to use because this is one of the big bottlenecks for blockchains is that they can be too slow and too expensive to support real world use cases. And for that reason, we've seen a ton of excitement around things like Solana, Binance Smart Chain, Avalanche, and so many more. And in this video, I want to talk about another trend that could be just around the corner that could get the same level of attention. And what you need to understand about this, because this is not something that everybody's really talking about just yet. So I'm going to talk about that on this video today, explain everything you need to know as a blockchain developer myself who works with this technology on a daily basis. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory. On this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to become a blockchain master step by step from start to finish, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's get into this. Let's talk about this big trend that could be around the corner that could get everybody excited about blockchain again. So what is it? Well, it's application specific blockchains or app chains. Okay, so you might have heard this term floating around there if you're paying attention to this space at all. For this video, I'm going to break it down and what you need to understand about this and how this could be a trend going forward. So let's first talk about the problem that, uh, app, or what really what app chains are and what problem they solve. So, you know, let's talk about, you know, using a blockchain specific application. So let's say you're using an app like Uniswap, for example. This is one of those forked applications that's been put across pretty much every single blockchain. It's a decentralized exchange. So, you know, Uniswap got a lot of attention in 2021 because all these new people just like got into crypto, were super excited because they could start making money with uh, coins by flipping in them on decentralized exchanges or DEXs. And one of the hottest places to do that was Ethereum. Okay. And so, you know, that was the original home of Uniswap. So people got on Uniswap and were like, yeah, I'm going to make some money. And they realized they had to pay, you know, $50 plus uh, every time they swapped a coin because there's so much network demand. Everybody's like, hey, this is never going to work. And so, you know, that, that got Ethereum a reputation for being too slow, too expensive to use. And we saw all these other blockchains like Solana and Avalanche and others, you know, Binance Smart Chain come out to try to fix this problem to make, you know, layer one blockchain itself, like competition to Ethereum, much cheaper to use. And for that reason, they got a ton of hype. And now I want to talk about another thing that could get a similar level of attention. So let's talk about how you put an application out there on blockchain in the first place and how you make it faster. So you can put an app like Uniswap out on a blockchain like Ethereum like this. So you can see, you know, from a really simple perspective, let's just say that Uniswap runs with one smart contract. It's a lot more than that, but let's just say it's a smart contract by itself, okay? So what you do is you put that smart contract on a blockchain, okay? It's like your backend, and the user connects their wallet to a browser, and that browser connects to the blockchain that can use your application, okay? And so that's how I basically work on Ethereum. It's on this network of decentralized nodes that all talk to one another. And so, of course, Ethereum got that reputation for being too slow, too expensive to use. And for that reason, you know, we saw new blockchains like, you know, Avalanche, Binance, Smart Chain, Solana pop up, that essentially do the exact same thing. So basically... They were uh, either recreating a new technology from scratch that makes some compromises, some trade-offs to make the blockchain faster and cheaper to use, or they essentially just forked Ethereum and changed some settings. Now, let's talk about a new strategy that's coming onto the scene to try to combat this problem of cost and also speed, which is the app chain strategy. And that's what I'm talking about in this video. So what that looks like is basically taking this model and instead of this, you know, blockchain network right here powering a bunch of different applications, it just powers one application. And really, that's just the application that it's built for, okay? And so we're seeing uh, lots of projects start to take this strategy, especially projects that have already, you know, shipped something out there on a public blockchain. And they're like, hey, we're going to kind of pivot for our own use cases over to an app chain. So let's actually look at an example of that and talk about the benefits of the app chain strategy uh, and how they're working. So... Essentially, that's with DYDX. So DYDX is a derivatives exchange that was originally built on top of Ethereum, okay? It also migrated to Ethereum Layer 2 scaling solutions, okay? Basically, this is where uh, you build a second layer on top of Ethereum to, you know, uh, essentially do the transactions there, and then you rely upon Ethereum security in order to uh, maintain your network. But DYDX announced that they are pivoting towards running their own Cosmos-based app chain. So let's break that down so that you can understand. So first of all, you know, what is Cosmos? So Cosmos is basically a technology that lets you spin up your own blockchain pretty easily with the Cosmos SDK, okay? And also what's important about these is that they essentially are cross-chain compatible, so you can connect them to other blockchains that people can easily move between the networks, okay? It's based upon Tendermint Proof-of-State consensus, and it essentially gives you that benefit of high throughput decentralization and customizability. And so that's really what Cosmos is for. It's a big leader in this space. 
Uh, and so really, you can create an own blockchain to do really whatever you want to. But the whole point here is that you're creating your own blockchain that's purpose built specifically to run your application and tuned for its needs specifically. So instead of having a, you know, a public blockchain where anybody can build anything on top of it and all those apps can talk to one another, this is where the blockchain is specifically built for that specific application and then other blockchains can talk to it and so that, you know, other people can get onto your chain and start using your application. That's the whole idea of an app chain versus a, you know, a public blockchain with other apps built on top of it. So, you know, why, why the move with DYDX? Well, one of the biggest reasons for them is talking about um, essentially their, their their specific needs for their application. So DYDX is an exchange that has an order book with a matching mechanism on top of it. And, you know, prior to this move, a lot of that was done off chain, okay, with, uh, you know, centralized web services, okay? So the whole idea here is that they would be able to move that aspect of their system onto an actual blockchain itself because, you know, that type of system would not work at all right now on top of a, a blockchain like Ethereum or even Avalanche or Solana, okay, or any, you know, proprietary Ethereum layer 2 scaling solution. And that's why they're moving over to Cosmos to create their own app-specific chain to do that. And one big benefit here is that there are no uh, trading gas fees, okay? One major benefit of Cosmos is that the chain can be developed to suit the exact needs of the DYDX network. And for this reason, they won't have to pay exchange fees uh, with gas whenever they make trades. And that's because whenever they create this blockchain, they customize it, they can actually specify that whenever somebody does something with the app itself, that they won't have to pay that fee in order to include that transaction on the chain. And that's different from a regular blockchain where it's just like, if you, anybody's doing any transaction, we have to pay a fee every single time that we do that. All right, so that's an example of one project to watch in this space is like Cosmos. Cosmos is a huge player when we're talking about the app chain idea. Okay, DYDX is a good example of somebody who has you know, gotten quite a bit of traction the blockchain space and is actually, you know, making the move towards an app chain. And we're seeing other projects start to follow the same type of idea so that they can, you know, customize the uh, blockchain for the specific use cases. So let's summarize the benefits here. You know, number one is you can tune the, the blockchain for the application itself. This is kind of like moving towards the Apple idea of integrating hardware and, you know, software uh, tightly with one another versus like, you're know, just creating a device that can install anybody's app versus like Apple, you know, getting things, uh, you know, really tightly together. Another reason is scaling, okay, basically trying to find ways where you can make stuff a lot faster and cheaper to use, in some cases completely free, okay, for end users because you have control over the chain when you're saying, hey, you're making a transaction with the application, we don't have to charge for it. But one other major reason, okay, uh, that I want to talk about that is is uh, almost a sole reason in and of itself that we could see app chains start to pop up is brand new cryptocurrencies. So you can see here, like each Cosmos chain that traditionally has its own validators and layer one staking tokens. So one reason that we're probably going to see a lot of other people move for this app chain is just basically to launch a new cryptocurrency. Every time we see, you know, a new trend pop up in this space, there's always an excuse to launch a brand new crypto. And this is no exception. We're going to have a place where people can run validators. They can stake the tokens. People love staking tokens. And they also love tokens that have some type of value accrual mechanism to them and also a real utility in the space. And it's like almost for this region alone, I can start to see this trend really starting to increase. All right, so those are some of the reasons that people are doing it. Those are the benefits that I've clearly outlined here. Now let's talk about some of the cons. Those are the pros, these are the cons. You know, what are the drawbacks? So first, let's look at the idea of the scalability trilemma. Okay, this is always the problem that you're talking about whenever you're trying to make blockchains faster and cheaper to use. There's three things that are always held in tension with one another. Scalability, which is basically, you know, uh, how fast and how many transactions can you do? Uh, security, obvious, no, no, no explanation needed there. And then also decentralization is how spread out is the responsibility of running your network to help, you know, maintain censorship resistance and all that type of stuff. And the whole idea is you can really pick two things out of this to optimize for and you're usually making some sort of trade off with the other one. So in my opinion, one of the big downsides to this type of thing is that you're uh, greatly reducing the decentralization. Okay, also the security as well. But decentralization is definitely the biggest compromise here. Now, in terms of like something like DYDX, you know, there's actually a little bit of a benefit, okay, uh, that they're getting from taking their order book off of, you know, basically a server and moving it towards an app chain. It's probably a little more decentralized than what they were doing before. But for many of the other use cases where we're just taking features that should be really on a public blockchain and moving towards the app application chain, it's compromising decentralization in a pretty big way. Now, we've seen tons of uh, you know, examples where people don't care that much about decentralization, especially uh, we're talking about smaller amounts of money or, you know, in type of a big bull market where people are just trying to get in and get out and make big gains. Okay. But that is one of my top critiques of this particular strategy. 
So another um, big critique of this strategy in terms of drawbacks is basically having blockchains communicate with one another, okay? One of the biggest reasons that blockchains have value in the first place, like Ethereum, for example, is the idea of network effects. You know, whenever you have an application, whenever you have a blockchain like this, that's just an open platform that anybody can deploy apps to, all those apps can talk to one another, okay? And they can rely upon one another. It's like the whole idea of having a social network. You want actual friends on that social network. So likewise, you want other users and other applications on a blockchain in order for them to have value. And that's kind of limiting with an app chain. Now, their answer to that is essentially to uh, create cross-chain communication protocols, okay, that solve this problem. But my critique there is that answers another failure point, okay, because over $2 billion were stolen this year alone in bridge exploits, okay. So these are cross-chain communication protocols that have pretty big security vulnerabilities. And until we find ways to really make bridges that are airtight, I think that's going to continue to remain to be a problem for app chains. All right, so those are some of my initial thoughts in terms of drawbacks. Okay, so we talk about the pros, talk about the cons. Now let's talk about my final concluding thoughts. Do I think that app chains are going to be a big deal? Do I think that they have a long-term potential in the Web 3.0 space? So my initial thoughts are that the foundations for a big trend are definitely there, okay? Just like I talked about before, pretty much everybody, you know, in the Web 3.0 space is always excited about some new idea that has really yet to gain a ton of steam because there's all these financial incentives to get ahead of that trend and position it and really, like, you know, be the cheerleader for that because, you know, there's always cryptos associated with that that could go up. Everybody loves to ride a technological wave. So I think the foundations for that are there. So the real question is, does that trend have staying power? Is it just going to be hype? Is it just going to be another boom and bust cycle? Okay, so my my thoughts are that it does potentially have staying power for specific applications, for specific use cases, okay? It also is quite possibly just another trend that people get really excited about for and then come to see the drawbacks or just the market takes a turn in the opposite direction and then they just forget about it. But in terms of it being a long-term thing that just completely replaces the model of public Public blockchain infrastructure where you have a network of applications that talk to one another. I really don't see that laying out for the long term and becoming the dominant way people actually use blockchains because I think people don't really want to jump in between blockchain ecosystems all the time. There is that value of network effects and we're not really anywhere close to having some like master uh, aggregator that can find liquidity across different chains to be orchestrated by some like master process. Yeah, we're just not there. So in summary, I do think there's a ton of potential here for a big trend. I think that trend could have some long-term staying power, but it's not going to be the predominant way that we use blockchains for everything in the future. All right, so that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That helps this video is out so the more people can learn about blockchain. And if you're as fast and with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty. How can you get started today? Well, you can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can show you a master blockchain step-by-step -step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.